Good evening and welcome to this special Music and Ideas presentation for International Women's Day, Super Women of the MSO. Tonight's event is supported by the City of Melbourne and is proudly presented by Equity Trustees. I would like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, the people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to the First Australians and their elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Kelly O'Dwyer and I'm a non-executive director on the Equity Trustees Board, but you may recognise me from my previous role as the member for Higgins in the Australian Parliament for nine years and a former cabinet minister, including as a minister for women's affairs. When I started out in politics at the age of 32, critical to my development was the fact that I had a range of fabulous mentors from which to draw on, both formal and informal. Mentors give both encouragement and insight and their support is just as important as all the talent that we will no doubt hear about, especially see witnessed on display here tonight when we hear from Hannah Q, who is already a clearly promising member of the MSO administrative team, and she will share her perspectives, and also from recollections of wonderfully talented trailblazing women of the NS MSO, Bertha Jorgensen. I'm fortunate that in the relatively early stages of my career as a board director, I have found some immensely inspiring women on the board at Equity Trustees, including our chair, Carol Schwartz AO. Equity Trustees has a long history, more than 130 years, and is a Melbourne institution. Like the MSO, we call Victoria home, but our reach is national, even international. And we both, actually we all, owe something to a former client whose estate we manage to this day, Dame Nellie Melba. Dame Nellie Melba is largely credited with popularising not just Australian musical excellence, but also the gramophone and making the radio accessible as well as great music possible for everyone. Equity Trustees has fostered the arts through the legacy of our clients. There is also an art to giving that stands the test of time. It takes planning, purpose and patience. As a leading source of philanthropic funding in Australia, we steward funds on behalf of our clients towards supporting women, girls, education and the arts. And it's why we're so proud to be the presenting partner of the MSO's International Women's Day program. In its 115 year history, the MSO has established itself as an important, vibrant and resilient cultural institution. Tonight's event celebrates the women who have built the foundation for that strength and explores how the superwomen of today inspire and nurture the leaders of tomorrow. To begin tonight's event, please join me in welcoming MSO Concertmaster Sophie Rowell and Associate Artist Louisa Breen to perform Nocturne by Margaret Sutherland.
Hi everyone, my name's Hannah and it's such a pleasure to be here tonight. I uh, took it upon myself to represent the younger demographic by wearing some sneakers. <laughs> Everyone else looks so lovely. Um, what a privilege it is to tell my story uh, to you guys tonight. Um, so to kind of like angle my story, I thought, you know, my story is all about the next thing. Um, I feel like my life so far has been a series of pretty happy accidents. I've lived a very lucky life, I must say. As a Christian, I, um, there's, a, there's a bit of the Bible I really love from Ecclesiastes, which talks about there being a time for everything. And I can see now how that's really played out throughout my life. So let's start from the beginning. And my story's not just my own, it's also my parents. Um, they migrated from China in the late 90s, and I was born here just a year later. Um, so much of my childhood, um, my dad worked as a night shift cab driver, actually, for almost 20 years. So my mum, my sister, and I spent a lot of time together. When I was seven, I started playing the piano and the flute. The piano, because there was a scary lady at church who also taught piano, and it was the right thing to do as, you know, the Asian mother. Um, and the flute, because actually mum got gypped into it. We got a letter home from school, and it said, we're starting a band program, why don't you sign up? Me being in year two, I was about this tall, and they got me to play the flute. And it was a curved head joint, couldn't make a sound for about six months. And my parents were extremely mad about having to pay tuition fees. Luckily, things improved. By the time I was in year seven, I scored a scholarship to a private girls' high school um, in Sydney. And it was an extremely privileged place. There were co-curriculars for everything, sport, music, tours to Europe, the whole shebang. Um, I graduated there as deputy head prefect, which gave me so much insight into how things are run behind the scenes. Um, so then it was on to the next thing. I went to uni. At this point, I had two options. Either it was I went to the con to study music performance, or I did an international studies and languages degree. Um, and at that time, I thought, you know what? I am never going to get into the con again if I don't go now. So I decided, OK, let's do music. So it was a four-year degree. And it was funny, because at that point in my life, I had been so good at everything. Like, whoops, not to toot my own horn, but it was so easy to be good in high school. And at uni, I found out I was actually quite average. Um, you know what? That built a lot of character and made me learn that I just had to learn a bit of humility and also that there was so much to learn from the other people around me. I also did a lot of traveling when I was in uni and I realized, actually, I really enjoyed organizing things. I was obsessed with itineraries and I like to run productions. Um, so at the end of uni, I attended AYO's National Music Camp um, in the orchestra management um, program. And that was really pivotal because it just opened up a whole new world of people and exciting like career options that I hadn't even known about before. Then at that time, COVID hit, and everyone knows how that story goes. But um, at the time, I was really lucky to score actually a role in project management. Um, and what I learned there was the, the importance of defining a higher meaning or a higher purpose to why we run things and why we do things every day. Um, I also had a great mentor when I was in that position. Um, so yeah, much like someone mentioned before, it's all the people who have come before us who have paved the way, and it's, there's so much wisdom to learn from them. Then I, at that, I really missed the arts. I'd spent about a year and a half doing project management. So I wanted to marry up my love for project management and also my love for classical music. And so it was time then to make the move. Um, so in June last year, I moved from Sydney to Melbourne for this position. And now, honestly, I feel I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. When people ask me what I do for my job, it's quite hard to explain sometimes, but honestly, I just tell them I find out all the juicy details of how much we pay artists to come here <laughs> and whether or not they need accommodation and things like that. And I put that all in a contract and send it off and it happens. Um, so that's that, but on, a, on another level, I get to see the organisation from the ground up. That's been really interesting to 
um, kind of understand all the nitty gritty things that happen behind the scenes. Um, so, sorry. Um, so what's the next thing? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of things have kind of just happened to me throughout my life and I've been very lucky that they've been good things. Um, my identity very much has been through good experiences and things like that. Um, and I'm realizing now actually that the things that I do every day shape more and more the person that I'm becoming. For example, the other day, I I'd never thought of myself as a plant person. I always scoffed at them and thought, oh, gee, that's such a waste of time and money and space. Like I've been quoted as saying, the only plant I want is one that's edible. Um, so as I carried home my sixth pot plant on Sunday, I realized I had unintentionally become one of those plant people. So it's so interesting to see how life experiences and things really shape who you become, whether it's intentional or not, and will continue to change who I'm becoming. Um, yeah, I very much feel like my story is still being written. It's kind of hard. When I was briefed on doing this, it was hard to distill exactly where I am, being in the middle of my own story. Um, but anyway, that's it for now, and I'll see you for the next instalment. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd love to invite up now Sophie Rao, who's MSO's current concert master, and we'll, she'll tell us a bit about Bertha Jorgensen, the MSO's first concert master. Thanks, Hannah. And it's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce the next segment of today. Bertha Jorgensen was Australia's first female concert master in a professional orchestra, and she was one of the world's longest service serving orchestra leaders. She was principal violin, as it was known then, but now concertmaster of the MSO from 1923 to 1969, which is an awful long time, if you ask me. I've been here for eight years, <laughs> so that's an awful lot more. <laughs> Valerie Auburn, who was a member of the cello section in the MSO from the 1940s to the 1990s, yes, 50 year span. It's a long time that you stay in the MSO as a musician, and it's wonderful. Um, well, she spoke to us about the experience of working with Bertha for many of those years. If Bertha said something to us, we, I'm sure we'd take a notice of it. You felt secure that she was there. She did such a terrific job always. She was very approachable and, and enthusiastic about everything. She worked very hard at her, at her job. He got all the kudos, the, the conductor. Bertha wasn't even mentioned by the artist. She was principal violinist at the time. He couldn't stand any women in the orchestra, the best of times, but he suddenly was thrown into the fact that he had a female leader. Womans, he wouldn't have any womans there. That was the feeling of most men, I imagine, at the time. No one ever seemed to mention those things. I think we just accepted it. She's proved her worth and he had to admit that she could do it. That's the thing, if you can do it and you're in the right position at the right time, that's it, isn't it? She was a strong woman, I think, because that's the thing that people don't understand, that people who are in music have to be strong. Actually, she uh, was sitting next to the leader of the very newly formed Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and Eugene Ormandy came to town and uh, told the leader at that time, a male, how wonderful he was and that he could easily get a job in his orchestra. So the concertmaster turned around to the ABC realising that he could po possibly get a pay rise out of it and said, please give me a pay rise or else I'll resign. And they said, we won't give you a pay rise. 
<laughs> so suddenly the MSO was left without a concert master and Bertha stepped up into the position. After a number of years of sitting in that position, just acting in it, she um, said, do you think you could recognise me as the leader? And they said, I'm sorry, it's not our policy to have females in leading positions. And it wasn't until the 19, uh, a few years after that even, and so it took about 15 years for her to get recognised as the concert master. From all accounts, she, uh, she was kind, she was calm, she was confident, and she did her job. And I think, as a concert master, if I can do those four things, then I'm doing the right things. Bertha do really <laughs> set, set things in the right motion for, for women in concert master positions. My, I came to the MSO in, in um, 2015 uh, as an audition for the associate concert master. So rather than taking 15 years, it took me um, three weeks of a very <laughs> arduous trial, including playing in front of the orchestra, and then I was offered the job and a few years later got promoted to concert master. So people like Bertha certainly made it easier for us. Mm. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Tiffany Cheng, a member of our second violin section. Um, and perhaps you can tell us mm. your story to getting the job in the MSO. Yeah, well, um, so I'm from Wollongong and that's kind of where I started learning the violin and everything. And did my uni degree in Sydney under uh, Dr. Robin Wilson. So that was four years and after that had no idea where to go really. Didn't really want to go overseas. So I followed him down to Melbourne to the Australian National Academy of Music or ANAM as we all know it. And <laughs> that's where I met Sophie who was also um, slated to be my teacher. And so I was one of those trial students who had both Robin and Sophie as teachers, which was a difficult thing having instruction from two people who are very different players and having them teach you the same thing, but in a little bit of a different way. And so that kind of actually helped me to learn for myself what I needed. And so after a year, we all realized it wasn't quite working anymore. So I was like, so I was Robin, <laughs> I have to break up with you now. I'm sorry, thanks for the five years. <laughs> Not that I didn't, you know, keep having lessons and things because he was still a teacher permanent at, um, at Anam. So I'd always be playing for him and everything and getting shoots of him, but you became my main teacher. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so that was two years, two more years of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fun times. <laughs> I learned very quickly that you're not very good at having lessons early in the morning. No. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was scheduled from 11 onwards. <laughs> um, yeah, and then right towards the end of my time at Anam, um, some jobs came up and I went for the first violin job in 17, which was my first audition ever. And I was like, I don't really know what's going to happen, see how it goes. Uh, which I did all right in and didn't get. Thankfully, now I have Anne-Marie Johnson, who's now my colleague in the first violins. Um, and then a few months later, the second violin job came up, which I think suits me a lot better, I must say. <laughs> so I went for that, somehow managed to get through to pre-trials and it took a year of trialing just that it was a really long process to go from pre-trials to trials and then to finally be offered the position. So that was 2018. So yeah, and since then, nice little time of COVID. And then, um, and here we are playing concerts again, which is magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a really interesting time for us, wasn't it? The changing of our relationship from being, you're my student and then I, mm. as, as, it's an amazing time to be a teacher at, at the end of somebody's uh, university study because on the violin or in music there's no real path is there at the end no and you're questioning everything yes but there's also the benefit of having one person as your mentor because um, other people in other fields just like talking to my brother <laughs> he was trying to decide what to do with his life and I was like just go talk to your teacher <laughs> he was like what <laughs> don't have one <laughs> we get a lecture who does like you know 200 people so it was it's it makes you really grateful 
and fortuitous to have someone that's really determined to see you do your best that you can as a person rather than just a wash of students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you came to the orchestra, I, it was hard because I, I wasn't your teacher anymore. So <laughs> I, I had to take a step back. And did you notice that too? Yeah, yeah, it's for that sure. transition, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that was a weird time. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really know quite how to approach you because, I mean, that was a, it was so awkward because I couldn't, I wasn't a student anymore, but I wasn't, didn't feel quite professional either. Um, hadn't quite figured out what, uh, what I needed to do. And also added to that, you were on my panel. And that also <laughs> made things more difficult. You couldn't be the one making decisions, so you stepped back. Um, but it was, um, it was a nice little path that we've got now that we've kind of took a while to get over that, and now we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's worked out pretty well. It? <laughs> yeah, it yeah. has, it has. I mean, but, well, if you had to say what was the one thing that you, or something that you took away from me? As a... um, to be, to be a musician is to be a person. Like you can't just play, who cares? Like anyone can do that. But people want to work with people. And so, um, especially through lockdown, like we had to kind of really um, reflect on why we play. Cause I mean, we had two years of nothing. What do you do? Like two years of not making music, two years of emptiness and it really makes you question, like, one, what's your worth? What's the worth of music to society? And what's your own personal worth when what you do has been completely, not decimated, but it's just not happening. So you have to really think about why you do things. And for me, which was what you, you were the first person to be like, hey, I want to see what Tiffany Chen delivers. Um, yeah, that really made me revisit that and to strengthen that idea of who I am and what I play and why I play. And that was a really, really important time to have that growth, even though it was horrible, it was great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, good. I yeah. think, um, yeah. In was it the same for you? Like, yeah. kind of? <laughs> well, I, I always learn um, from my students and I, in particular, I remember learning, it, you always want to find that spark that is the, the person and, and the musician that they're going to become. But what I remember learning from you is that when there's a spark, it turns into an absolute bushfire. And I, <laughs> I didn't need to push it because you found the music that you loved, the Bartok second sonata, which you played with Louisa, who yeah. was, with whom I was playing earlier, and you learned it in about three days. And <laughs> oh, I, just, I couldn't believe what had happened. So it's, it's that you, you reminded me to, that I needed to Yes, um, find the path for the student, but actually remember that the student also needs to show you the way too. So it's that combination. Mm. Oh, and another thing. When you said soz before, it reminded <laughs> me. You're the first person who ever said soz, and now I've learned a lot about... Um, I learn a lot about the language of text messages through the way that you <laughs> <laughs> write to me. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I always write back in really good English. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> look, you, you mentioned lockdown, and um, we have it just in the most fortunate position, don't you think, coming mm. out of it now? We're, we've been two, two weeks back on the Hamer Hall stage with our new chief conductor. Mm. We've been doing my bowl concerts, everything. What... What is it? Okay, what's the best thing about being back and what did you learn in lockdown? Best thing about being back is being on stage with everyone again. Like, I mean, like I said before, I don't play... Like, playing in a ro room all by yourself is just sad. Like, mm -hmm. it's just a sad side. <laughs> it's not really for me. Like, I do it for people. I do it to play with other people. And, it, like, music's for sharing. It's not really meant to be heard alone. So. I just really, I really have enjoyed playing with everyone and being on stage again and just being around everyone again. That's been amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, just the noise. <laughs> and when we did Marla One and there was this huge cymbal crash and all the, oh, the drums were going yeah. and I got the chills up my spine, yeah. which I haven't had for ages, yeah, which is really good. But I think lockdown also taught me about that, like that we don't, you don't play music for yourself. No. Nah. You, I, I, I practice music for myself so that I don't let other people down or I play my best, but I think being back with other people and it's other people on the stage and it's the buzz backstage, but mm. it's also 
um, having new audience and, and being able to take our masks off and things that we never even thought about before. It was just habit to go on the stage and mm. have people. And if I said that, I sort of love the sound of applause. Is that OK? <laughs> <laughs> so that's good to have it back. I um, mean, speaking of, um, we are lucky to be playing together again. And should we maybe get ready and do something about <laughs> yeah, that? let's do it. <laughs> OK. Sophie and Tiffany will now perform Slicked Back Tango by Australian composer and former MSO uh, composer in residence, Elena katz -Chernin. Wow, how was that amazing? Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Tiffany. Now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you the CFO of the MSO, Sharon Lee. Thank you, Guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I guess I, oh, I guess I will just sit down so we can have a little bit of conversation. Uh, with Dai, actually, my, sorry, my name is Sharon, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. So I'm a qualified accountant, a mom of two, and a CFO of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. I guess, what do I do, right? So always I meet new people, and then they're like, you know, what do you do? I was like, I work for the orchestra. <laughs> and that, that's when their eyes are sparkled with excitement and joy. And I was like, oh, so I don't play instrument, though. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's when everyone was like, oh, but what do you do then? <laughs> I was like, I work in the finance, but I guess what do I do is really, uh, I just think about, I just really configure and adjust the GPS for the nonstop engine for the MSO. <laughs> like, I would really, you know, wave my flag and say, 50 miles away, there's a service station, and maybe we should stop and fill it up, right? We're <laughs> almost running out. And maybe when we are very close to our destination, and also just one final push, let's accelerate and let's get there, nail it, get it done. And I guess that's, you know, in a nutshell what I do, but in a more formal term, when I just, you know, in front of, uh, you know, my peers and my colleagues, and of course I monitor, I, my team and I actually, monitor the financial health of the organization and ensuring the financial longevity 
of the orchestra. So I joined the MSO team in 2018. Next Friday will be my fourth anniversary with the orchestra. So yay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's, it's been not, 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 not six months, not, not, not nine months, but it's been four years and I guess I had a little bit flavor of pre-COVID and, <laughs> and post-pandemic for sure. But um, uh, during my time here, I uh, spent some time to really elevate the mission of the finance team. So we really brought finance and risk management kind of front and center. So we influenced the decision making and also um, ensure that the orchestra can maximize its impact. And I guess over the last two years, uh, just you know, trying to stay on top of all those financial planning, a scenario modeling as all the other financial you know, professionals would do. I also have been leading the digital transformation of the orchestra. I guess once the pandemic hit us, we also found an, an opportunity within all this pandemic is that there's opportunity for us to really modernize our infrastructure and upgrade our technology and really integrate our you know, database so we can create that single source of truth so we can unlock business intelligence because uh, one thing COVID told us is we need to make decisions quickly and we need to be agile and nimble about our business planning. So I guess uh, all my work uh, I have been leading to date is to uh, unlock that capability of business intelligence from the huge asset we have, which is the database we have. Right, so I'm not just not gonna bore you even more <laughs> with, with my kind of with data and everything, but I guess it's been a really busy time, you know, with the orchestra, my role's been evolving, and I had another huge achievement. Well, I stay with the MSO, I gave birth to child number two in the midst of this very busy job, and the MSO has been super, super supportive. Um, I guess before the MSO, I came to Australia to study Master of Laws, uh, completed my internship, and then I decided to pursue an accounting degree. Since then, uh, I worked in different accounting roles in various industries, finance, banking, manufacturing, fintech, and the arts, and I've been enjoying it very much so far in the MSO. I guess that, that's, that, that's it for me. Now I guess back to you, Dai. You have been on the MSO's board for four years, and Dai, you have been such an inspiration to me, and is a fantastic mentor. Um, I guess we would like to hear about your life stories and your experience as a board member and a deputy co-chair. Thank you, Sharon. Well, where do I start? Uh, my journey with the MSO started in 2018 when I joined the board and I sat next to one of the other female board members, Margaret Jackson, and thought at the end of the meeting, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Margaret is just an inc incredibly awesome person, and, uh, but I soon got into the groove, as they say. I joined the finance committee and then within 12 months I chaired the finance committee and these days I'm also co-deputy chair. It's been an incredible journey the last four years. But going back in time, uh, what's my story? Well, I was born in Brisbane. I had a mother who was a fantastic pianist who always wanted me to be a pianist. Thank goodness I chose finance rather than, <laughs> because when I walked in here this evening and saw the piano, I thought, oh no, they don't want me to play the piano, do they? <laughs> Fortunately, that wasn't on the agenda. Uh, so anyhow, when I, I obviously went through the normal uh, schooling, university, etc., and started my life, my only job I had was as an analyst, a financial analyst, and I did that in the mining industry for seven years and then discovered that life for a female in the 70s wasn't really all that wonderful because they, everybody was wondering when you were going to get married and then when you got married, when you were going to have children. So life was not that much fun. It was also too before the deregulation of the banking industry. So that meant that everything with finance at that time in Australia happened overseas. So I then just decided that, well, if I was going to make a difference, I had to do it myself. So that meant in 1982, when I was two, 
um, <laughs> I decided that I would actually go out on my own and set up my own practice. And I was a one-man band for quite a long time. Now, for those of you who are good at maths, I know Sharon is, um, this year will be in June my 40th year in practice. I can't believe actually that it's 40 years because it does feel like two years ago. But I now have uh, about 25 staff. Um, my base is still in Brisbane and I've just had this incredible journey. And life is about you know, the things that happen to you. That's, ma that's what makes you who you are. And I'm very thankful for the journey I've had. Lots of speed bumps along the way, of course, but the speed bumps are what makes you who you are. And that's the part that I think you cherish, is that you can't know everything, you will never know everything. But at the end of the day, it's about that learning curve of, okay, my favourite saying is, if you say to me, you can't do that, well, you can imagine what my response is. It's called watch me, <laughs> um, because that's how it is. So my time at the MSO has been probably, well, it's been so incredible, but at the same time, very challenging. And talking about that, this is where I'd actually like to actually throw back to Sharon and share with you a little bit about what our journey together has been, because it's not, when you think about a team, and the MSO is an incredible team, how many eyes are there in team? There aren't any, are they? So we have to work together as a team. And Sharon and I, I think, we make an amazing team. We think very similarly, but at the same time, it's never what's perfect or what's right, it's actually what we, what we can do, isn't it? Yes. So Sharon, what's been your experience working with me? <laughs> because a lot of my team will say, oh my God, here she is again. <laughs> a, little so, bit of, a little bit of that too, I gotta be honest. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna lie, but I guess uh, overall it's been a very uh, exciting experience for me. But I guess one, you know, uh, before I kind of you know, talk about the work we do together, I guess it's also make, make a lot of sense for me to speak to it in the overall context of, you know, challenges and opportunities. Because I, I, I lead a risk management, I always like to say, Challenges and opportunities, they go hand in hand, really. You can't just see challenges without any you know, opportunities for sure. And I guess um, uh, COVID provide a lot of challenges to all the business and to every one of us. But I guess uh, pre-COVID, the MSO was on the trajectory of building its financial resilience. So uh, we had a pretty good run, I got to say, for a few years. Mm -hmm. Everything was upwards and onwards. Just to give you a little bit dimension, like pre-pandemic in 2019, our ticketing revenue was $14.6 million alone, which you know equivalent to 40% of our annual income for that year, which also covers 40% of the cost base. Right, so I guess uh, in uh, one COVID hit in 2020, we had nine months the venue were closed, and uh, and 2021 there were five months kind of we were in and out of lockdowns and venue were closed, and we had to cancel all the concerts during that time, and um, we just simply lost that income, isn't it? So 2021 we were able to perform for a bit and we actually lost about $11 million of our income. So leaving 11 millions of our expenditures uncovered. So thinking about that is pretty scary. So I guess our you know, superhero story pre-pandemic became our you know, biggest risk. We have to uh, respond to and very, you know, get, get, get really nimble and agile about finding the solution. Uh, happy to talk a lot more about the so, solution we found, but communication is one thing we work a on. Step back yeah. though, what we had to do was rethink what we were going to do. So putting my finance hat on, and I'm sure that the audience will really appreciate this, how well you love looking at profit and losses and balance sheets and how you really understand them. I can see everybody's nodding yes. <laughs> um, in other words, no. And this is the challenge when you actually work in finance is to actually get your message across in such a way that people can understand what really is happening in such a way that they don't feel frightened, 
but at the same time, they want to jump on that train with you. So one of the big challenges that Sharon and I had was, it was very good from a financial perspective, you can look at all the finances and weave totally across them because we're on the same page. But it's a little bit like me going over to that piano and playing a piece and thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? How am I going to actually do that? So what we did was we put our heads together and decided that we needed to make everything change to a visual because when you are actually playing music, that's visual. You can see, you know, Sophie playing there and Tiffany playing. So we get that. We see what's happening. We see the violins, etc. But with finance, we don't really see that. So what we had to do was turn it from being where it was on paper to just numbers to visuals. And how we achieved that was actually using colours. So when you think about uh, when you are driving your car and the first thing that happens, you come to a set of lights. If that light is red, what do you do? You stop and you think. So using the colours and what Sharon actually touched on, we had, we were sort of, our success was so great with ticket sales and the wonderful performances that our musicians were doing that we were really in trouble because when COVID came, we didn't have that. So we needed to really get the message out and that was that what had stopped for us was revenue from ticket sales. So we did a pie chart and we made that colour, guess what that colour was to demonstrate the, the loss of revenue. Yes, it was red because that's the colour you actually recognise. So we broke everything down into an outcome that made it much easier for people to understand and it was about the organisation so that we were all on the train together rather than, oh, the finances are this and, oh, the musicians are doing that. COVID was an incredibly challenging time for everybody. It wasn't just the musicians. It was also too, I mean, Melbourne had the biggest lockdown of all, of any, uh, anywhere in Australia or anywhere in the world actually. So how do you actually adjust? So we spent, we became the queens of Zoom, <laughs> as I think everybody did. But on top of that, it actually made us really think about our communication skills. And that's really what teamwork is about. And I think women particularly are really good at saying what they think. Whereas um, I know my partner who's actually sitting over there, he doesn't operate on the same basis. It's actually, oh, what do you think? Rather than what we, th what we think. We actually say what we think. So going forward, what have we learned from this? What we've learned is we have to be flexible. We have to be adaptable. But more importantly, we have to actually care for each other because isn't that what it's about? Mm. And that is just a beautiful way of actually doing it with music and the arts because that's really what it's about. So what I'd actually like to do now is actually go back to Sophie because Sophie actually got out very easily with actually asking Tiffany all the questions. <laughs> and I think we'd like to hear a little bit more about what Sophie has been thinking because with being in the MSO for the last eight years, what was it like for you, Sophie, before COVID and now after COVID? Mm, that's a really good question. And it actually reflects on what Sharon was saying about that rise in ticket sales. We were working our arms off and our fingers off and, and, and thought nothing of it. There were fantastic concerts. We, we were doing such a range of concerts and really developing our, our audiences, I, I, I remember. Um, and then suddenly, actually twice, the two lockdowns that have happened have been the week before my play direct every time. So I've, I've done a lot of practice for nothing. Having come out of that though, I was very, um, I wouldn't have said I was a rigid person or an inflexible person. I'm certainly not in lots of things, but I like order and I like, I like to know what I'm doing. And as a concert master, because I have um, a lot of other playing commitments, I know what I'm doing a year in advance. I know exactly the pieces that were in my schedule that I had to learn. And then suddenly they weren't in the schedule and new things were cropping up all the time. And I, I had to adapt and be nimble and, be, and 
I enjoy that of myself now. I enjoy that of our orchestra um, in, on all levels, from, from production through, although the production probably wouldn't say that too much, but um, <laughs> through, through the musicians, through, right, all through the finance, everybody, we just, we've learnt that we can change and we, we need to embrace that change and not look forward to it, but accept it. And I think that for me is really something that I'll take going forward and, and I imagine it's something that people who are, if Tiffany had been at Annam in the last two years, she would have come out a very different person having to, oh, yeah. to mm -hmm. learn all that as a student. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. great, Sophie, because it is the experiences that make us who we are mm -hmm. and the speed bumps of life are actually what makes us because how you negotiate those speed bumps is really how it works. Mm -hmm. And I know that the flexibility with my own team back in Brisbane that we've actually had to adapt as well. And with finance, we actually haven't had the same issues that you've had to deal with because we're not in the same position. We're not have actually having to perform, but also too, you've got to juggle families. So talking about juggling families, Sharon touched on earlier that she had a second <laughs> baby. Um, so how was it for you, Sharon, with your family, juggling the family at home with the Zoom meetings and COVID and still keeping the fires burning at the MSO? <laughs> It's a good question, but I guess it's not just for me, it's for every of my colleague. Like, you know, in Zoom meetings, we can see all those little babies crawling and our oh, fur babies as well, right? <laughs> and the, the kids come over just getting a little bit bored and then they got to sit in front of the TV, right? So I guess uh, COVID, I was always amazed by how agile, adaptive and resilient we all can be when we got, you know, uh, forced to face challenges, right? So I guess uh, with the pandemic, it's really a, got a story, you know, in front of our face and now everyone got to deal with it and got to deal with it quickly. Uh, I was always m amazed by how, you know, resilient and how adaptive our people are and our organization is. Mm. Uh, we actually embraced the risks got you know, put in front of us and we uh, quickly adapt and we respond quickly, form an action plan. And it was also very amazing. Yes, we got you know, wrapped under the moment a little bit, but it's really amazing that our musicians really stood up and uh, you know, uh, wor like, you know, work with our uh, audiences and ring up our donors and ring up our ticket buyers and uh, just keep engaging you know, our valuable audiences there. And uh, it just, you know, we kept the music playing despite the concert venue were closed. And we kept engaged our audiences. And we also, you know, um, enhanced our digital footprint. And now we have this, uh, you know, li live streaming on YouTube and just look at how many programs are there. So it's just been amazing to see how adaptive and resilient, like, you know, individuals and the organization can be, you know, through the COVID, just mm, to survive exactly. and thrive. And that gets mm. back again to the teamwork that's actually occurred. And even with the four years that I've actually been associated with the orchestra, how much you, you just see how happy everybody is to see one another. Mm. And that's really, you know, that's really heartfelt, firstly. But also too, we're all in this together. We weren't on our own. And that was the sort of the key to it. No matter where you were, what you were doing, we're all in it together. So Hannah, from your perspective, because you're one of the younger members, what's your take out from where we've come from and where we are now? We're, we've got a very short answer, unfortunately, because okay. I'm being wound up over here. Yes, that's true. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I obviously started just before the last lockdown. Um, you know what, every time lockdown happened, you know, I'd be in the office, everyone would be in the office actually, and we'd be like, lockdown's tonight. And then we'd be like, beers, run out and go get a beer. <laughs> and then come back, pack up, pack up your stuff and go home. It almost felt a bit like, you know, when it's too hot to go to school or if, if you have a snow day or something, like, Maybe maybe because I didn't have that many responsibilities, but um, <laughs> it definitely felt exciting. Like, um, well, how can we improve ourselves in the time that we've got off now? 
um, COVID poked a lot of holes in our contracts and our, um, just in the processes, like you said, about communicating. Um, all those things weren't in place beforehand. And through these processes, we now have so many more flexible ways of working. And um, I, like, honestly, do, I don't hope for any more lockdowns, but um, it was, uh, yeah, an exciting challenge and valuable for the organisation to learn. Um, yeah, that's good. That's my experience. And Tiffany, <laughs> you always have to have the last say. So <laughs> I, I might say that when um, Sophie was saying about later mornings, in fact, <laughs> Tiffany's very good at early mornings, but it's actually at the other end. It's actually at night into yes. the early mornings. I'm That's right, isn't it? That. Yes, yes. Okay, I so. am very much a night owl. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so during lockdown, I did a heck of a lot of growing, like personal growth. I mean, I'd done all the violin growing already and got to a stage where I was good enough to get a job. But to do the personal growth, to kind of reach a level that um, that makes you the best musician that you can be, or musician slash person. And so I learned a lot about balance, learning how to balance what being a musician means, what it means in my life, and do I even have a life if I'm not a musician? all those big philosophical questions that you're just sitting there going, oh my God. Um, but also like finding people who really are genuine, real people that you can trust and, and being part of that family. And so the MSO family, for example, we really banded together and it was a horrible time. So we all got together and you know, made it, made it happen, made exactly. stuff happen. And like, there wasn't any other way, like you couldn't do it alone. No, that's right. So and so that's really a good way to actually finish our part yeah. is that I've had an amazing journey with the MSO. It's, and I know all of the musicians now really well. I know if they're early birds or <laughs> late birds, <laughs> they know a lot about me and I don't get the questions now. So you live in Brisbane, what are you doing here? Or why are you interested? Uh, that common um, answer to me is it's all about you and it's all about music. So on that note, I'd actually like to welcome back Kelly O'Dwyer to actually close for us this evening. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much, Di, and thank you to all of our fabulous superstars of the MSO. I think we've been so privileged tonight um, to have these shared experiences, and I really want to thank each and every one of you for sharing your journeys with us. Thank you, Di, Sophie, Sharon, Hannah and Tiffany for sharing your stories with us tonight. And tomorrow night, we continue our International Women's Day celebrations as we discuss women in music with a panel of industry leaders and experts. You can find out about this and future events in the Music and Ideas series by visiting the MSO website. On behalf of Equity Trustees, the City of Melbourne and the MSO, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. And as a finale, we are very privileged to welcome again Tiffany Cheng to perform Cascades by Jessamy Keitler. Thank you. <laughs>